Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to Pray First. Today is Tuesday, March 5th, 2022. Come on in here. Let's welcome each other. Let's say hi to each other. As you can tell, um, I am not Dennis Pitts. Dennis Pitts usually hosts our Tuesday morning, but we like to mix things up a little bit, so um, he and I may be switching, or I may just have covered this one for him, because can I tell you how many times he takes my pray first when I have things come up. So anyways, it is Tuesday morning. I'm so excited to be here with you today with my cup of coffee outside on my porch. It's finally warm enough. Well, actually, it's a little chilly, but I was inspired by Pastor Brandy who keeps going on her porch, and I thought, I can do it. Plus, it's um, it's just beautiful outside. I love the, the sound of the rain. Um, I don't like it when I'm sleeping, but when I'm awake, it doesn't bother me at all. Good morning, Brenda. Good morning, Daryl. Hey, Bonnie. Good morning, Ed Rose. How are you doing today? Good morning, Neil. <coughs> How are you guys doing? So I'm on my second cup of coffee. I've had one of those nights that never stops, you know what I mean, where you're just hoping that you can actually sleep, but it's just not going to happen. So um, coffee, coffee, coffee. And it says best mom ever because my daughters like to remind me. <laughs> just kidding. Good morning, Anita. Good morning. Um, Bill Wooten, how are you doing, sir? Hey, Gail Hannah. So how many of you guys out there like the sound of rain? Like the sound of rain is soothing and you like thunderstorms and all that fun stuff? Because typically speaking, for me, that's like white noise and I don't like any white noise. I like silence when I sleep. So my husband loves it. Anytime it's in the thunderstorm, he like wants to open up all the windows so he can hear it even louder. And I'm like, want to put earphones on, which I don't like to do that either because I don't like anything on my ears. Totally random. And good morning, Kelly Saldo. Hey, Randall. How are you guys doing this morning? Hey, Lana, how are you? Kareen Stickley, how are you doing this morning? Okay, so I know that Pastor Brandy, hold on one more sip of my coffee. I got into the story of Absalom and all that mess. I'm telling you, the family drama that's in this, in the word, it's even better. It's like, it's like watching Judge Judy and, um, what was that guy's name? Oh my gosh, he was on the tip of my tongue. You know the one who always had all the drama uh, during the daytime TV? Help me out here. Someone out there, remember the name where you weren't sure who your baby's daddy was? And so they always, anyways, one of you guys will remind me because let me tell you, my brain is not functioning. But like she said, um, you don't need to watch TV. Ooh, Jerry Springer, it just came to me. In case someone of you out there were thinking about it too. You just need to read the word because in the word there's so much drama and nothing, I'm telling you, nothing, nothing is not in here. It'll entertain you. Um, it'll give you wisdom. It'll see. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Dara. Um, good morning, George. It'll give you all the drama you ever needed and more. And watching the way, remember how Pastor Doug always says it, it's not experience that teaches you. It's evaluated experiences that teach you and sometimes it's a lot of fun it's actually better if you evaluate your experiences based on someone else's mistakes so you learn from their mistakes rather than your own one of the things that I always um, say is for me I would rather be um, gently humbled than radically humiliated so as much as I possibly can I like to watch I like to learn goodness gracious the word teach us because if you're abiding in the word it helps you to make choices so that you can stay humble and not get humiliated all of that to say let's get started all right friends so we are on second samuel chapter 14 hey karen hey barbara shook how are you doing all right here we go <clears throat> hey donna baker joab son of zariah knew that the king deep down still cared for absalom so he sent Tekoa for a wise woman who lived there and instructed her, Pretend you are in mourning, dress in black, and don't comb your hair so you'll look like you've been grieving over a dead loved one for a long time. Then go to the king and tell him this. Joab then told her exactly what to say. The woman of Tekoa went to the king, bowed deeply before him in homage, and said, O oh, king, help. And he said, How can I help? I'm a widow, she said. My husband is dead. I had two sons. The two of them got into a fight out in the field, and there was no one around to step between them. The one struck the other and killed him. Then the whole family ganged up against me and demanded, Hand over this murderer so we can kill him for the life of that brother he murdered. They want to wipe out the air and snuff out the one spark of life left to me. And then there would be nothing left of my husband, not so much as a name on the face of the earth. So, now I've dared come to the king, my master, about all this. They're making my life miserable, and I'm afraid. 
I said to myself, I'll go to the king. Maybe he'll do something. When the king hears what's going on, he'll step in and rescue me from the abuse of the man who would get rid of me and my son and God's inheritance. The words. As your handmaid, I decided ahead of time. The word of my master, the king, will be the last word in this. For my master is like an angel of God in discerning good and evil. God be with you. The king said, go home and I'll take care of this for you. I'll take all responsibility for what happens, the woman of the Koa said. I don't want to compromise the king and his reputation. Bring the man who has been harassing you, the king continued. I'll see to it that he doesn't bother you anymore. Let the king invoke the name of God, said the woman, so this self-styled vigilant will ruin everything to say nothing of killing my son. As surely as God lives, he said, not so much as a hair of your son's head will be lost. Then she asked, may I say one more word? Thanked my master, the king. He said, go ahead. Why then, the woman said, have you done this very thing against God's people? In his verdict, the king convicts himself by not bringing home his exiled son. We all die sometime. Water spilled on the ground can't be gathered up again. But God does not take away life. He works out ways to get the exile back. The king then said, I'm going to ask you something. Answer me truthfully. Certainly, she said, let my master, the king, speak. The king said, is the hand of Joab mixed up in this? On your life, my master king, a body can't veer an inch right or left to get by within its royal presence. Yes, it was your servant Joab who put me up to this and put these very words in my mouth. It was because he wanted to turn things around that your servant Joab did this. But my master is as wise as God's angels in knowing how to handle things on this earth. The king spoke to Joab. All right, I'll do it. Go and bring this young man Absalom back. Joab bowed deeply in reverence and blessed the king. I'm reassured to know that I'm still in your good graces and have your confidence, since the king has taken the counsel of the servant. Joab got up, went to Geshur, and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. The king said, he may return to his house, but he is not to see me face to face. So Absalom returned home, but was not permitted to see the king. This Absalom, there wasn't a man in all Israel talked about so much for his handsome good looks, and not a blemish on him from head to toe. When he cut his hair, he always cut it short in his crane because it had grown so heavy. The weight of the hair from his head was over two pounds. Three sons were born to Absalom and one daughter. Her name was Tamar, and she was a beauty. Absalom lived in Jerusalem for two years, and not once did she, he see the king face to face. He sent for Joab to get him in to see the king, but Joab still wouldn't budge. He tried a second time, and Joab still wouldn't listen. So he told his servants, listen. Joab's field adjoins mine, and he has a crop of barley in it. Go set fire to it. So Absalom's servant set fire to the field. That got him moving. Joab came to Absalom at home and said, Why did your servant set, set fire to my field? Absalom answered him, Listen, I sent for you saying, Come and soon. I want to send you to the king to ask, What's the point of my coming back from Geshur? I'd be better off still there. Let me see the king face to face. If he finds me guilty, then he can put me to death. Joab went to the king and told him what was going on. Absalom was then summoned. He came and bowed deeply in reverence before him, and the king kissed Absalom. Chapter 15 As time went on, Absalom took to riding a horse-drawn chariot, with fifty men running in front of him. Early each morning he would take up his post beside the road at the city gate. When anyone showed up with a case to bring to the king for decision, Absalom would call him over and say, Where do you hail from? And the answer would come, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say, look, you've got a strong case, but the king isn't going to listen to you. Then he'd say, why doesn't somebody make me a judge for this country? Anybody with a case could bring it to me and I'd settle things fair and square. Whenever someone would treat him with special honor, he'd shrug it off and treat him like an equal, making him feel important. Absalom did this to everyone who came to do business with the king and stole the hearts of everyone in Israel. After four years of this, Absalom spoke to the king. Let me go to Hebron to pay a vow that I made to God. Your servant made a vow when I was living at Geshur and Aram, saying, If God will bring me back to Jerusalem, I'll serve him with my life. The king said, Go with my blessing, and he got up and set off for Hebron. Then Absalom sent undercut of our agents to all the tribes of Israel with a message. When you hear the blast of the, Sam's, the ram's horn trumpet, <clears throat> that's your signal. Shout! Absalom is king in Hebron. Two hundred men went from Absalom from Jerusalem. But they had called together nothing of the plot and made the trip innocently. While Absalom was offering sacrifices, he managed also to involve Ahithophel the Gilanite, David's advisor, calling him away from his hometown of Gilo. The conspiracy grew powerful and Absalom's supporters multiplied. 
Someone came to David with a report. The whole country has taken up with Absalom. Up and out of here, called David to all of his servants who were with him in Jerusalem. We've got to run for our lives or none of us will escape. Absalom, hurry. He's about to pull the city down around our ears and slaughter us all. The king's servant said, whatever our master the king says, we'll do. We'll, we're with you all the way. So the king and his entire household escaped on foot. The king left ten concubines behind to tend to his place, palace, excuse me. And so they left step by step, and they caused they paused to the house, house as the whole army passed by him. All the Kirathites, all the Pelathites, and the six hundred Gittites, who had marched with him from Gath in the past. The king called out to Ittai the Gittite, What are you doing here? Go back with King Absalom. You're a stranger here and freshly uprooted from your own country. You arrived only yesterday. Am I going to let you take your chances with us as I live on the road like a gypsy? Go back and take your family with you. And God's grace and truth go with you. But Ittai answered, As God lives, my master the king lives. Where my master is, that's where I'll be, whether it means life or death. All right, said David, go ahead. And they went on. Ittai the Gittite with all his men and all the children he had with them. The whole country was weeping and loud lament as all the people passed by. As the king crossed the book Kedron, the army headed for the road to the wilderness. Zadok was also there, the Levites with him, carrying God's chest of the covenant. They set the chest of God down. Abiathar standed by until all the people had evacuated the city. Then the king ordered Zadok, take the chest back to the city. If I get back in God's good graces, he'll bring me back and show me where the chest has been set down. But if he says, I'm not pleased with you, well, he can then do with me whatever he pleases. The king directed Zadok the priest, here's the plan. Return to the city peacefully with Ahimezaz, your son, and Jonathan, Abiath, our son, with you. I'll wait at a spot in the wilderness across the river until I get word from you telling me what's up. So Zadok and Abiathar took the chest of God back to Jerusalem and placed it there, while David went up to the Mount of Olives, weeping, head covered, but barefoot. And the whole army was with him, heads covering and weeping as, as they descend, ascended. David was told, Ahithophel has joined the conspirators with Absalom. He prayed, O oh God, turn his counsel to foolishness. As David approached the top of the hill where God was worshipped, Hushai, the archite, clothes ripped to shreds and turned on his head, was there waiting for him. David said, If you come with me, you'll be just one more piece of luggage. Go back to the city and say to Absalom, I'm ready to be your servant. O oh, king, I used to be your father's servant, now I'm your servant. Do that and you'll be able to confuse Ahithophel's counsel for me. The priests, Zadok and Abiathar, are already there. Whatever information you pick up in the palace, tell them. Their two sons, Zadok's son Ahimezes and Abiathar's son Jonathan, are there with them. Anything you pick can be sent to me by them. Hushai, David's friend, arrived at the same time Absalom was entering Jerusalem. Chapter 16. I'm going to pause for a cup of coffee. I mean, a drink of coffee. Chapter 16. Shortly after David passed the crest of the hill, Mephibosheth's steward, Ziba, sent him with a string of pack animals, saddled and loaded with a hundred loaves of bread, a hundred raisin cakes, a hundred baskets of fresh fruit, and a skin of wine. The king said to Ziba, What's all of this? The donkey, said Ziba, are for the king's household to ride. The bread and fruit are for the servants to eat, and the wine is for drinking, especially for those overcome by fatigue in the wilderness. The king said, And where is your master's grandson? Well, he stayed in Jerusalem, said Ziba. He said, This is the day Israel is going to restore my grandfather's kingdom to me. Everything that belonged to Mephisabeth, said the king, is now yours. Ziba said, How can I ever thank you? I'll be forever in your debt, my master and king. May you always look on me with such kindness. When the king got to Baharun, a man appeared who had connections with Saul's family. His name was Shimei, son of Geru. As he followed along, he shouted insults, and he threw rocks right and left at David and his company, servants and soldiers alike. To the company of curses, he shouted, Get lost, get lost, you butcher, you hellhound. God has paid you back for all your dirty work in the family of Saul and for stealing his kingdom. God has given the kingdom to your son Absalom. Look at you now, ruined and good riddance, you pathetic old man. Abishai, son of Zariah, said, This mangy dog can't insult my master of kings this way. Let me go and over and cut off his head. But the king said, Why are your sons of Zariah always interfering, getting in the way? If he's cursing, it's because God told him. Curse David. So who dares raise questions? Besides, continued David to Abishai and the rest of his servants, my own son, my flesh and bone, is right now trying to kill me. Compared to that, this Benjamite is small potatoes. Don't bother with him. Let him curse. He's preaching God's word to me. And who knows, maybe God will see the trouble I'm in today and exchange the curses for something good. 
David and his men went on down the road, while Shimei followed along down the road and the hill alongside, cursing, throwing stones on them, and kicking up dirt. <clears throat> By the time they reached the Jordan River, David and all the men of the company were exhausted. There they rested and were reviewed. Revived, excuse me. By the time Absalom and all his men were in Jerusalem, and Achithophel was with them, soon after Hushai the archite, David's friend, came and greeted Absalom. Long live the king, long live the king. Absalom said to Hushai, Is this the way you show devotion to your good friend? Why didn't you go with your friend David? Because, says Hushai, I want to be with the person that God and his people and all of Israel have chosen, and I want to stay with him. Besides, who is there to serve other than his son? Just as I served your father, I am now ready to serve you. Then Absalom spoke to Ahithophel, Are you ready to give counsel? What do we do next? Ahithophel told Absalom, Go and sleep with your father's concubines, the ones he left to tend to your palace. Everyone will hear that you have openly disgraced your father, and the morale of everyone on your side will be strengthened. So Absalom pitched a tap on the roof in public view and went in and slept with his father's concubines. The counsel that Ahithophel gave in these days was treated as if God himself had spoken. That was the reputation of Ahithophel's counsel to David. It was the same with Absalom. All right, friends, we are going to go ahead and stop there at the end of chapter 16. Like I said, it's, it's, it's crazy to me. It is absolutely crazy to me how much drama there is. And how David, you know, he, he appears this valiant warrior. Remember how many people he slayed in all the different all the different wars and stuff that he led? But it's different. Isn't it different when your family's involved? So when his son's involved, I think your perspectives just change. And I also liked his perspective when he had the guy, you like hurling insults on him. And he goes, seriously, like that's a problem for me when my own son's trying to kill me? Perspective checks are an important thing, my friends. So um, good morning. Good morning to everyone. Um, one, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I forgot, of course, at the beginning that if you hashtag live and hashtag record, we can do it at the end, right? You guys have a fantastic, fantastic day. Um, I can't believe it's just the beginning of the week. It's going to be a glorious week. I'm very, very excited. So um, I'm going to pray us out of here so you can get started on your day. So Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for all my friends who come on board. Um, Lord, to just talk to each other, fellowship with each other, learn from hearing the word, glean things at first thing in the morning, Lord, from hearing his word, Lord. So, no spirit but your Holy Spirit. Have your way with my friends. Thank you for all that you're going to do for us today. Have everyone have a blessed day and keep us safe. We love you and we love them. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, have a great day, Barbie and Sarah and Donna. Let's see who else is still there. I see your names flipping up. So, And sometimes I go so quickly, that's the reason why I can't do a shout out for everyone. But otherwise, if I could, I would. You guys have a great day. Bonnie, you have a great blessed Tuesday as well. Have a great day, Anita. Have fun up there in Hernando. Bye, Karen. Okay, see you guys later, all right? Love you.